So, hi again. I'm in my studio and it's the 25th of April. By the time you see this CD, it's going to be <laughs> the end of August, maybe September, I don't know. Because I produce now each Sunday about eight or ten videos and they'll be tacked on together one a week. And Anyway, to make a long story short, I was talking about sea trumpets in one of the earlier uh, videos, and I wanted to talk about this wonderful sea trumpet. This sea trumpet I picked up in 1970, excuse me, 1976 in Ch uh, Chicago on my way to study at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. I just got a four-year full scholarship to study there. It's the elite school in the United States. There's only 125 students complete, including opera. And uh, this is uh, really a level above Juilliard. And every, all of the teachers there are from the Philadelphia Orchestra. So, um, and to get into the school, you have to have a full scholarship. And there's only four trumpet students. At the time, I went there to study with a man named Gil Johnson, but he'd, because I'd heard him play the Blue Mine, uh, Mahler, uh, post horn solo, and whatever, but he had already then gone to uh, Miami to teach at Miami, and Frank Catarabic had, uh, had taken his position. So. When I got there, I played for Frank Katarabic, and he took me as a student there. And um, in any event, on the way there, I picked up the C trumpet. I didn't own a good C. I didn't. I think I had a C trumpet, a, a Holton or something that didn't work at all. So on the way to Philadelphia, I went through Chicago and talked to him. And Mr. Schilke picked this trumpet out for me personally. This and a second trumpet, a G trumpet, a G1L three valve. I'll be showing you that in another YouTube. Uh, it's an EG trumpet that I play the humble trumpet concerto on uh, sometimes. I have, I think, three G trumpets uh, or E trumpets or EG trumpets. I don't know. I don't remember. Anyway, this is the C trumpet. And um, it's um, a C1L and uh, had a gold plated after I bought it in silver, gold plated here in Germany. And uh, after a while, I was looking for a certain color of sound. In Philadelphia, they were playing very bright. Frank uh, played a Bach C trumpet because he'd been before in the Chicago Symphony with uh, Bud Ursith, and they tend to want to play very bright and sometimes very loud. And Frank was playing very loud, and he had some of his students come with him from Detroit. He was after in the Chicago Symphony and Detroit Symphony before he came to Philadelphia. And so uh, a couple of the students there, Brian Moon, for example, they played extremely aggressive and, and bright. I really like the B-flat trumpet sound more than the C trumpet sound anyway. I usually, actually later, even in the Bamberg Symphony, I played mostly B-flat trumpet. So um, later in, in 1980, when Schilke was over at the Frankfurt Messe, I took his C trumpet and I said, you know, Mr. Schilke, I have all your instruments, an E-flat and piccolo, P54 and whatever, and B flat, B1L and whatever, but your C trumpet, I have a problem with it. And he said, oh, let me look at that trumpet. And so he took it and he, he looked at the valves and he said, okay, I'll take it back to Chicago. And he took it back to Chicago and he turned the valves, he aligned the valves and sent it back to me, no charge. Which was very gracious of him, especially because the reason that I didn't really understand uh, what was wrong with the trumpet is because there wasn't anything wrong with the trumpet. What was wrong? With me, I didn't know how to play a C trumpet. A C trumpet is a horse of another color. And if you try to play it like a B flat trumpet with the same uh, sound in your ear, it's not going to work for you. A C trumpet has other, other intonation idiosyncrasies. That's why when you saw me before playing uh, the Mussorgsky on either the rotary valve or the piston valve French trumpets before, uh, I played the, the fourth line D with a one and three valve combination and move the third valve slide because that first valve alone, which you would easily play on the B-flat trumpet, isn't really markedly too flat on the B-flat trumpet, on the C trumpet, excuse me. So I'll just demonstrate that for you. Schilke trumpets are wonderful trumpets, and Schilke was a genius, no question. He also played in the Chicago Symphony, he played in the Chicago Brass Quintet with Adolf Erzett. 
Uh, he was a kind of a gruff guy, and I think he had some personal problems that made him drink a little bit. But um, but he wonderful, wonderful trumpet builder, and uh, no question that he was one of the greatest instrument makers of all time. This mouthpiece that I had for that I'm playing with the trumpet, actually, I talked before about adapters or uh, about receivers. You can see this is a receiver that was made actually for this trumpet that was built for me in Canstle, by Canstall in California. And you see that the receiver, they look exactly the same, just at two different dimensions, as if this was size 3 and this is size 5. And the mouthpieces that I made when I was developing mouthpieces for instruments for Canstall fit these trumpets perfectly. You can see. So this is a continuation. But to play the Schilke trumpet with that, I just add this little full. This is not, uh, not like an adapter, a, a light adapter that I showed before that is sort of like hollow. This is a full metal. And this goes right over the mouthpiece here and fits right into the... And so you, you see that it's like even a continuation of this. Is, and so... But it's not only fitting outside this way, but inside the mouthpiece touches up against the lead pipe inside. There's no gap. Now there's a lot of people have written actually doctoral theses about the gap position of a mouthpiece, which is just bad acoustics and just bad plumbing. I'm sorry. I don't know why someone would be allowed to write a doctoral thesis about the gap in the mouthpiece, except for the fact that when you make a gap, then you have a problem with the, 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 a discontinuation of the conicality of the back bore of the mouthpiece into the, into the bore of the, and the conicality of the lead pipe. It's just bad plumbing. But uh, to make a long story short, the more consistent this is, the better and more precise the, the, uh, the instrument plays when you speak. And so to uh, demonstrate that when on this Honiger, Many people, when they hear that, they're going to probably be comparing how I play that with Maurice André or Guy Touvron or, or who the hell knows. Well, I play it the way I feel it. It's very, I play it very freely. And I can remember when I wanted to leave the Bamberg Symphony Orchestra, I didn't like the way, I didn't actually like the quality of the conductors that they had coming in. And uh, also the attitude to some of my colleagues who weren't practicing and weren't taking their job seriously. Um, so I, I heard about a job that was open in Hilversum in Holland. So I drove there and broke one of the springs, <laughs> one of the valves of my Porsche getting there, but it finally did arrive and did the rehearsals with the pianist for, a, 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 for the, a competition for the solo position, coordinate solo position with the Hilversum Radio Orchestra. And one of the required pieces for the first round was the Honecker. So I practiced with the pianist, and he said, wow, man, that's fantastic. This is going to be great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, you know, doing this with you and whatever. And we did the audition, and I played and whatever, and I didn't even get past the second round. 
I didn't get even to the it didn't get even into the second round. And we were sitting in the cafe afterwards, and he was shaking his head. The pianist, he said, "I don't understand. I heard the other people playing. Why they didn't even want you in the second round?" And uh, he said, "Oh, there's the there's the coordinate solo trumpet player. He must have been sitting in the in the jury. Why don't you ask him?" So I went up to him and I said, "My name is Stuart. Uh, maybe you didn't. You know, I, we were playing behind a curtain, so he he didn't know me, didn't see me personally." And I asked him, you know, I was number two, in the, uh, and um, I was just wondering why you didn't take me into the second round. Was I didn't make any mistakes and whatever. He said, oh, oh yeah, you were there? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, we don't play Honiger like that here. I said, oh, that's interesting. You, you, know, you don't, okay. So, but this is a position of solo trumpet, right? He said, yeah, and coordinate. So I would never play it like you would play it anyway. I mean, I, I, as a solo trumpet player, I... I have to have my own personality, right? And my own way of playing. Yeah, but we don't play, we don't play Honiger like that here in Holland. I said, well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So uh, should I have bought a CD of you playing the Honiger and try to play like you before I came here so that I can play like you and then fit into the, the, way, the style that you play Honiger in Holland? He said, uh, well, no, I don't have a recording of that. I don't have a CD of me playing the Honiger. And I said, well, I do. Would you like to buy one of mine? He said, well, I don't understand. I said, what, why, why do you invite someone for a solo trumpet position and, and don't allow him to have his own personality? If I'm supposed to play like you, first of all, I has to hear how you play. But we've never played together because it's coordinated solo trumpet playing anyway, which means either you play or I play. He said, well, you know, to be honest with you, you're, you're over 45, you're too old for the position anyway. I said, well, why the hell did you invite me to come here anyway and waste my time? You see, sometimes people are just so stupid and ignorant that they don't think about what other people have to do. They, they don't think at all about it. And it brings me back to a story about when I was playing the Third and Seventh Symphony with Beethoven. In, uh, with Mr. Gielen, I noticed that uh, after we'd recorded this, I noticed uh, during the recording, I saw there on the pin board that, that Mr. Walter Schultz was going to step back and his position of solo trumpet was going to be open. He was going to go back to the second trumpet. So I said, I'd like to do the audition. And they said to me, oh, oh, Mr. Stewart, this was, I think, about 40 years old. He said, oh, Mr. Stewart, you're over 40 years old. You're, you're too old for, to, to do this audition. I said, I'm too old to do the audition, okay. Then I, but I'm not too old for you for one day to the next to come here to record the Third and Seventh Symphony of Beethoven. I said, maybe I just pack up my trumpet and go home and you look for somebody else to finish the recording. Oh, no, you can do the, uh, yeah, sure, sure, you can do the, you can do the uh, audition. So I did the audition. And everyone wanted me. As a matter of fact, the second trumpet player even took me to, to, to show me where, you know, how the situation works. And we were talking about, uh, you know, houses there and what they cost and whatever. <laughs> and who decided to veto it? The conductor, Mr. Geelan. The guy that didn't know the difference between a piston valve, rotary valve, or natural trumpet anyway. But uh, these are the things you experience in life. And sometimes it's better not to have gone there where you're in Hilversum, not respected, or in Baden-Baden, in where a conductor makes decisions that don't have anything to do with reality because he thinks he knows the history of what things are, but doesn't have the respect for the musicians that he's conducting and hasn't learned to give a con clear conducting beat in the first place. Well, that's my opinion anyway. So <laughs> I hope you'll tune in again and listen to me talk about my experience of life as the man with the horns, Richard Carson Stewart, continues. Bye.